Part One The biotechnicians had been very thorough. I was already a little undersized, which meant that my height and build were suitable. I could pass for a big earthling. And, of course, my face and hands and so on were all right, the earthlings being a remarkably humanoid race. But the technicians had had to remodel my ears, blunting the tips and grafting on lobes, and cutting the muscles that moved them. My crest had to go, and a scalp covered with revolting hair was now on the top of my skull. Finally, and most difficult, there had been the matter of skin color. It just wasn't possible to eliminate my natural coppery pigmentation, so they had injected a substance akin to melanin, together with a virus which would manufacture it in my body, the result being a leathery brown. I could pass for a member of the so-called white subspecies, one who had spent most of his life in the open. The mimicry was perfect. I hardly recognized the creature that looked out of the mirror. My lean, square, blunt-nosed face, gray eyes, and big hands were the same, or nearly so. But my black crest had been replaced with a shock of blonde hair, my ears were small and immobile, my skin a dull bronze, and several of Earth's languages were hypnotically implanted in my brain, together with a set of habits and reflexes making up a pseudo-personality which should be immune to any tests that the rebels could think of. I was Earthling, and the disguise was self-perpetuating. The hair grew, and the skin color was kept permanent by the artificial disease. The biotechnicians had told me that if I kept the disguise long enough till I began to age, say in a century or so, the hair would actually thin and turn white as it did with the natives. It was reassuring to think that once my job was over, I could be restored to normal. It would need another series of operations and as much time as the original transformation, but it would be as complete and scarless. I'd be human again. I put on the clothes they had furnished me, typical earthly garments, rough trousers and shirt of bleached plant fibers, jacket and heavy shoes of animal skin, a battered old hat of matted fur known as felt. There were objects in my pockets, the usual money and papers, a clasp knife, the pipe and tobacco I had trained myself to smoke and even to like. It all fitted into my character of a wandering outdoors sort of man, an educated atavist. I went out of the hospital with a long, swinging stride of one accustomed to walking great distances. The center was busy around me. Behind me the hospital and laboratories occupied a fairly small building, some eighty stories of stone and steel and plastic. On either side loomed the great warehouses, military barracks, officers' apartments, civilian concessions, filled with the vigorous life of the starways. Behind the monstrous wall, a mile to my right, was the spaceport, and I knew that a troop ship had just lately dropped graves from Valgolia herself. The center swarmed with young recruits off duty, gaping at the sights, swaggering in their new uniforms. Their skins shone like polished copper in the blistering sunlight, and their crests were beginning to wilt a little. All Earth is not the tropical jungle most Valgolians think it is. Northern Europe is very pleasant, and Greenland is even a little on the cold side. But it gets hot enough at North American center in midsummer to fry a shelest. A cosmopolitan throng filled the walkways. Soldiers predominated. Huge, shy Dakors, little slant-eyed Yangtusans, brawling gorads, all the manhood of Valgolia. Then there were other races, blue-skinned vegans, furry proximons, completely non-humanoid Syrians and Antarians. They were here as traders, observers, tourists, whatever else of a non-military nature one can imagine. I made an absent-minded way through the crowds. A sudden crack on the side of my head, nearly bowling me over, brought me to awareness. 
I looked up into the arrogant face of one of the new recruits and heard him rasp, Watch where you're going, Terry. The young blood in the Valgolian military is deliberately trained to harshness, even brutality, for our militarism must impress such backward colonies as Earth. It goes against our grain, but it is necessary. At another time this might have annoyed me. I could have pulled rank on him. Not only was I an officer, but such treatment must be used with intelligent deliberation. The occasional young garrison trooper who comes here with the idea that the natives are an inferior breed to be kicked around misses the whole point of empire. If indeed Earth's millions were an inferior breed, I wouldn't have been here at all. Valgol needs an economic empire. But if all we had in mind was serfdom, we'd be perfectly content with the plodding animal life of Deneb Seven or a hundred other worlds. I cringed appropriately, as if I didn't understand Valgonian Universal, and slunk past him. But it griped me to be taken for a Terry. If I was to become an Earthling, I would at least be a self-respecting one. There were plenty of Terries, terrestrials, around, of course, moving with their odd combination of slavish deference toward Valgonians and arrogant superiority toward mere Earthlings. They have adopted the habits and customs of civilization, entered the Imperial service, speak Valgonian even with their families. Many of them shave their heads, save for a scalp lock, in imitation of the crest, and wear white robes suggesting those of civil functionaries at home. I've always felt a little sorry for the class. They work and study and toady to us and try so hard to be like us. It's frustrating, because that's exactly what we don't want. Valgonians are Valgonians, and Earthlings are men of Earth. Well, Terries are important to the ultimate aims of the Empire but not in the way they think they are. They serve as another symbol of Valgonian conquest for Earth to hate. I entered the administration building. They expected me there and took me at once to the office of General Vorka, who's a general only as far as this solar system is concerned. Had there been any Earthlings around, I would have saluted to conform to the show of militarism, but General Vorka sat alone behind his desk, and I merely said, "'Hello, Coordinator.' The sleeves of his tunic rolled up, the heat of North America beating his forehead with sweat. The big man looked up at me. "'Ah, yes, I'm glad you're finally prepared. The sooner we get this thing started—' He extended a silver gala dust box. "'Sniff. Have a seat, Conru. I inhaled gratefully and relaxed. The coordinator picked up a sheaf of papers on his desk and leafed through them. Uh huh. Only fifty-two years old and a captain already. <laughs> Remarkably able, a young man like you. And your work hitherto has been outstanding. That Vagan business. I said yes, I knew. But could he please get down to business? You couldn't blame me for being a little anxious to begin. Disguised as I was as an Earthman, I felt uncomfortable, embarrassed almost, at being with my ex-countrymen. The coordinator shrugged. Well, if you can carry this business off, fine. If you fail, you may die quite unpleasantly. That's their trouble, Conru. You wouldn't be regarded as an individual, but as a Valgonian. Did you know that they even make such distinctions among themselves? I mean, races and sub-races and social castes and the like. It's keeping them divided and impotent, Conru. It's also keeping them out of the Empire. A shame. I knew all that, of course, but I merely nodded. Coordinator Vorka was a wonderful man in his field— and if he tended to be on the garrulous side, what could I do? I said, I know that, sir. I also know I was picked for a dangerous job, because you thought I could fill the role. But I still don't know exactly what the job is. Coordinator Vorka smiled. 
"'I'm afraid I can't tell you much more than you must already have guessed,' he said. "'The Anarch movement here, the rebels, that is, is getting no place, primarily because of internal difficulties. When members of the same group spit epithets at each other referring to what they consider racial or national distinctions which determine superiority or inferiority, the group is bound to be an insecure one. Such insecurity just does not make for a strong rebellion, Conru. They try, and we goad them, but dissension splits them constantly, and their revolutions fizzle out. They just can't unite against us, can't unite at all. Conru, you know how we've tried to educate them. It's worked, too, to some extent. But you can't educate three billion people who have a whole cultural pattern behind them. I winced. Three billion? Certainly. Earth is a rich planet, Conru, and a fairly crowded one at the same time. Bickering is inevitable. It's a part of their culture, as much as cooperation has been a part of ours. I nodded. We learned the hard way. The old Vagol was a poor planet, and we had to unite to conquer space or we would not have survived. The coordinator sniffed again at his silver box. Of course, and we're trying to help these people unite. They don't have to make the same mistakes we did long ago. They don't have to at all. Get them to hate us enough. Get them to hate us until all their clannish hatreds don't count at all. Well, you know what happened on Samtrak. I knew. The Samtraks are now the entrepreneurs of the Empire really ingenious traders, but within the memory of some of our older men they were a sore spot. They didn't understand the meaning of empire any more than Earth does, and they never did understand it until we goaded them into open rebellion. The very reverse of divide and rule, you might say, and it worked. We withdrew trading privileges one by one until they revolted successfully thus educating themselves sociologically in only a few generations. Vorka said, The problem of Earth is not quite that simple. He leaned back, made a bridge of his fingers, and peered across them at me. Do you know precisely what a provocateur job is, Conru? I said that I did, but only in a hazy way, because until now my work had been pretty much restricted to social relations on the more advanced Empire planets. However, I told him that I did know the idea was to provoke discontent and ultimately rebellion. The coordinator smiled. Well, that's just the starter, Conru. It's a lot more complex than that. Each planet has its own special problems. The Sam Tracks, for example, had a whole background of cutthroat competition. That was easy. We eliminated that by showing them what real cutthroat competition could be like. But Earth is different. Look at it this way. They fight among themselves. Because of their mythical distinctions, not realizing that there are no inferior races, only more or less advanced ones, and that individuals must be judged as individuals, not as members of groups, nations, or races. A planet like Earth can be immensely valuable to the Empire, but not if it has to be garrisoned. Its contribution must be voluntary and wholehearted. A difficult problem, I said. My opinion is that we should treat all exactly alike force them to abandon their unrealistic differences. Exactly, the coordinator seemed pleased, but actually this was pretty elementary stuff. We're never too rough on the eager lads who come here from Valgol and kick the natives around a bit. We even encourage it when the spirit of rebelliousness dies down. I told him I had met one. Irritating, wasn't it, Conru? Humiliating. Of course, these lads will be reconditioned to civilization when they finish their military service and prepare for more specialized work. 
Yes, treating all Earthlings alike is the solution. We put restrictions on these colonials. They can't hold top jobs and so on. And we encourage wild stories about brutality on our part. Not enough to make everybody mad at us, or even a majority. The rumored tyranny has always happened to someone else. But there's a certain class of beings who'll get fighting mad, and that's the class we want. The leaders, I chimed in. The idealists. Brave, intelligent, patriotic. The kind who probably wouldn't be a part of this racial bickering anyway. Right, said the coordinator. We'll give them the ammunition for their propaganda. We've been doing it. Result, the leaders get mad. Races, religions, nationalities, they hate us worse than they hate each other. The way he painted it, I was hardly needed at all. I told him that. Ideally, that would be the situation, Conru. Only it doesn't work that way. He took out a soft cloth and wiped his forehead. Even the leaders are too involved in this myth of differences, and they can't concentrate all their efforts. Luron, of course, would be the other alternative. That was a very logical statement. But sometimes logic has a way of making you laugh, and I was laughing now. Luron considered itself our arch-enemy. With a few dozen allies on a path of conquest, Luron thought it could wrest empire from our hands. Well, we let them play. And each time Loron swooped down on one of the more primitive planets, we let them, for Loron would serve as well as ourselves in goading backward people to unite and advance. Perhaps Loron, as a social entity, grew wiser each time. Certainly the primitive colonials did. Loron had started a chain reaction which threatened to overthrow the tyranny of superstition on a hundred planets. Good old Loron, our arch-enemy, would see the light itself some day. The coordinator shook his head. Can't use Loron here. Technologies are entirely too similar. It might shatter both planets, and we wouldn't want that. So what do we use? You, Conru. You get in with the revolutionaries. You make sure that they want to fight. You... I see, I told him. Then I try to stop it at the last minute. Not so soon that the rebellion doesn't help at all. The coordinator put his hand down flat. Nothing of the sort. They must fight. And they must be defeated. Again and again, if necessary, until they are ready to succeed. That will be, of course, when they are totally against us. I stood up. I understand. He waved me back into the chair. You'll be lucky to understand it by the time you're finished with this assignment and transferred to another. That is, if you come out of this one alive. I smiled a bit sheepishly and told him to go ahead. We have some influence in the underground movement, as you might logically expect. The leader is a man we worked very hard to have elected. A member of one of the despised races, I guessed. The best we could do at this point was to help elect someone from a minority subgroup of the dominant white race. The leader's name is Levinson. He is of the white subgroup known as Jews. How well is this Levinson accepted by the movement? Considerable resistance and hostility, the coordinator said. That's to be expected. However... We've made sure that there is no other organization the minority haters can join, so they have to follow him or quit. He's able, all right. One of the most able men they have, which helps our aims. Even those who discriminate against Jews reluctantly admire him. He's moved the headquarters of the movement out into space, and the man's so brilliant that we don't even know where. We'll find out, mainly through you, I hope. But that isn't the important thing. What is? I asked, baffled. To report on the unification of Earth. It's possible 
that the Anarch movement can achieve it under Levinson. In that case, we'll make sure they win, or think they win, and we'll gladly sign a treaty giving Earth equal planetary status in the Empire. And if unity hasn't been achieved, we simply crush this rebellion and make them start all over again. They'll have learned some degree of unity from this revolt, and so the next one will be more successful. He stood up, and I got out of my chair to face him. That's for the future, though. We'll work out our plans from the results of this campaign. But isn't there a lot of danger in the policy of fomenting rebellion against us? I asked. He lifted his shoulders. Evolution is always painful, forced evolution even more so. Yes, there are great dangers. But advanced information from you and other agents can reduce the risk. It's a chance we must take, Conru. Conrad, I corrected him, smiling. Plain Mr. Conrad Haugen of Earth. End of Part One Part Two A few days later I left North America Center, and in spite of the ominous need to hurry, my eastward journey was a ramble. The Anarchs would be sure to check my movements as far back as they could, and my story had better ring true. For the present I must be my role, a vagabond. The city was soon behind me. It was far from other settlement. It is good policy to keep the centers rather isolated, and we could always contact our garrisons in native towns quickly enough. Before long I was alone in the mountains. I liked that part of the trip. The Rockies are huge and serene. A fresh cold wind blows from their peaks and roars in the pines. Brawling rivers foam through their dales and canyons. It is a big landscape, clean and strong and lonely. It speaks with silence. I hitched a ride for some hundreds of miles with one of the great truck trains that dominate the western highways. The driver was earthling, and though he complained much about the Valgolian tyranny, he looked well-fed, healthy, secure. I thought of the wars which had been laying the planet waste, the social ruin and economic collapse which the Empire had mended, and wondered if Terra would ever be fit to rule itself. I came out of the enormous mountain lands into the sage plains of Nevada. For a few days I worked at a native ranch, listening to the talk and keeping my mouth shut. Yes, there was discontent. "'Their taxes are killing me,' said the owner. "'What the hell incentive do I have to produce if they take it away from me?' I nodded, but thought, "'Your kind was paying more taxes in the old days, and had less to show for it. Here you get your money back in public works and universal security.' No one on earth is cold or hungry. Can you only produce for your own private gain, earthling? The labor draft got my kid the other day, said the foreman. He'll spend two good years of his life working for them and probably come back hop-headed about the good old empire. There was a time, I thought, when millions of earthlings clamored for work, or spent years fighting their wars, gave their youth to a god of battle who only clamored for more blood. And how can we have a stable society without educating its members to respect it? I want another kid, said the female cook. Two ain't really enough. They're good boys, but I want a girl, too. Only the Iridian law says if I go over my quota, if I have one more, they'll sterilize me. And they do it, the meddling devils. A billion earthlings are all the solar system can hold under decent standards of living without exhausting what natural resources their own culture left us, I thought. We aren't ready to permit immigration. Our own people must come first. But these beings can live well here. Only now that we've eliminated famine, plague, and war, they'd breed beyond reason. Breed till all the old evils came back to throttle them, if we didn't have strict population control. Yeah, 
said her husband bitterly. They never even let my cousin have kids. Sterilized him damn right near after he was born. Then he's a moron, or carries hemophilia, or has some other hereditary taint, I thought. Can't they see we're doing it for their own good? It costs us fantastically in money and trouble, but the goal is a level of health and sanity such as this race never in its history dreamed possible. They're strangling faith, muttered someone else. Anyone in the Empire may worship as he chooses, but should permission be granted to preach demonstrable falsehoods, archaic superstitions, or antisocial nonsense? The old free earth was not noted for liberalism. We want to be free. Free? Free for what? To loose the thousand earthly races and creeds and nationalisms on each other, and on the galaxy? To wallow in barbarism and slaughter and misery as before we came? To let our works and culture be thrown in the dust, the labor of a century be demolished, not because it is good or bad, but simply because it is Valgonian, Epsilon, Eridanian. We'll be free, not too long to wait, either. That's up to nobody else but you. I couldn't get much specific information, but then I hadn't expected to. I collected my pay and drifted on eastward, talking to people of all classes, Farmers, mechanics, shop owners, tramps, and such data as I gathered tallied with those of intelligence. About twenty-five percent of the population, in North America at least, it was higher in the Orient and Africa, was satisfied with the Imperium, felt they were better off than they would have been in the old days. The Eridanians are pretty decent on the whole. Some of them come in here and act nice and human as you please. Some fifty percent was vaguely dissatisfied, wanted freedom, without troubling to define the term, didn't like the taxes or the labor draft or the enforced disarmament or the legal and social superiority of Valgonians or some such thing, had perhaps suffered in the reconquest. But this group constituted no real threat. It would tend to be passive whatever happened. Its greatest contribution would be sporadic rioting. The remaining twenty-five percent was bitter, waiting its chance, muttering of a day of revenge, and some portion of this segment was spreading propaganda, secretly manufacturing and distributing weapons, engaging in clandestine military drill, and maintaining contact with the shadowy Legion of Freedom. Childish melodramatic name! But it had been well chosen to appeal to a certain type of mind. The real organized core of the Anarch movement was highly efficient. In those months I spent wandering and waiting, its activities mounted almost daily. The illegal radio carried unending programs, propaganda, fabricated stories of Valgolian brutality. I knew from personal experience that some were false and I knew the whole imperial system well enough to spot most of the rest at least partly invented. I realized we couldn't trace such a well-organized setup of mobile and coordinated units, and jamming would have been poor tactics, but even so— The day is coming! Earthmen! Freemen! Be ready to throw off your shackles! Stand by for freedom! I stuck to my role. When autumn came, I drifted into one of the native cities, New Chicago, a warren of buildings near the remains of the old settlement, the same gigantic slum that its predecessor had been. I got a room in a cheap hotel and a job in a steel mill. I was Conrad Haugen, Norwegian-American, assigned to a spaceship by the labor draft, and liking it well enough to re-enlist when my term was up. I had wandered through much of the Empire, and had had a great deal of contact with Eridanians, but was most emphatically not a Terry. In fact, I thought it would be well if the red-skin yoke could be thrown off, both because of liberty and the good pickings to be had in the galaxy if the Empire should collapse. 
I had risen to second mate on an interstellar tramp, but could get no farther because of the law that the two highest officers must be Valgolian. That had embittered me, and I returned to Earth, footloose and looking for trouble. I found it. With officers' training, and the strength due to a home planet with a gravity half again that of Earth, I had no difficulty at all becoming a foreman. There was a big fellow named Mike Riley who thought he was entitled to the job. We settled it behind a shed, with the workmen looking on, and I beat him unconscious as fast as possible. The raw, sweating savagery of it made me feel ill inside. They let this loose among the stars. After that, I was one of the boys, and Riley was my best friend. We went out together, winching and drinking, raising hell in the cold, dirty canyons of steel and stone, which the natives called streets. Valgolia, Valgolia, the clean, bare, wind-swept heights of your mountains, sowing trees and thunderous waters, and Mara waiting for me to come home. Riley often proposed that we find an Eridanian and beat him to death, and I would agree, hiccuping, because I knew they didn't go alone into native quarters any more. I sat in the smoky reek of the bars, half deafened by the clatter and raucousness called music, trying not to think of a certain low-ceilinged quite tavern amid the gardens of Calarijo and sobbed the bitterness of Conrad Haugen into my beer. "'Dirty redskins,' I muttered. "'Dirty, stinking, bald-headed sons of bitches. Them in their goddamn empire. Why, you know, if it hadn't been for their laws, I'd be skipper of my own ship now. Uh, I knew more than that slob our cap'n. He was born Erid Eridanin. God, to get my hands on his throat. Riley nodded. Through the haze of smoke, I saw that his eyes had narrowed. He wasn't drunk when he didn't want to be. And at times like this he was suddenly as sober as I was, and that in spite of not having a Valgolian liver. I bided my time, not too obviously anxious to contact the Legion. I thought they were swell fellows, the only brave men left in the rotten, stinking empire. I'd sure be on their side when the day came. I worked in the mill and went out with the boys, lamented the fact that we were really producing for the damned Eridanians. We couldn't even keep the products of our own sweat. I wasn't obtrusive about it, of course. Most of the time we were just boozing. But when the talk came to the empire... I made it clear just where I stood. The winter went. I continued the dreary round of days, wondering how long it would take, wondering how much time was left. If the Legion was at all interested, they would be checking my background right now. Let them. There wouldn't be much to check, but what there was had been carefully manufactured by the experts of the intelligence service. Riley came into my room one evening. His face was tight, and he plunged into business. Con, do you really mean all you said about the Empire? Why, of course. I... I glanced out the window as if expecting to see a spy. If there were any, I knew he would be native. The Empire just doesn't have enough men for a secret police, even if we wanted to indulge in that sort of historically ineffective control. You like to fight them? Like, really, to help the Legion of Freedom when they strike? You bet your obscenity life, I snarled. When they land on Earth, I'll get a gun somewhere, and be right there in the middle of the battle with them. Yeah, Riley puffed a cigarette for a while. Then he said, Look, I can't tell you much. I'm taking a chance just telling you this. It could mean my life if you passed it on to the Eridanians. I won't. His eyes were bleak. You damn well better not. If you're caught at that... 
He drew a finger sharply across his throat. Quit talking like a B-class stereo, I bristled. If you've got something to tell me, let's have it. Otherwise, get out. Yeah, sure. We checked up on you, Con, and we think you're as good a prospect as we ever came across. If you want to fight the Eridanians now, join the Legion now. Here's your chance. My God, you know I do, but who— I can't tell you a thing. But if you really want to join, memorize this. Riley gave me a small card, on which was written a name and address. Destroy it thoroughly. Then quit at the mill and drift to this other place as if you've gotten tired of your work and wanted to hit the road again. Take your time. Don't make a beeline for it. When you do arrive, they'll take care of you. I nodded grimly. I'll do it, Mike. And thanks. Just my job, he smiled, relaxing, and pulled a flask from his overcoat. Okay, Con, that's that. We better not go out to drink after this. But nothing's to stop us from getting stinko here. End of Part 2 Part 3 Spring had come and almost gone when I wandered into the little main town which was my destination. It lay out of the way, with forested hills behind it and the sea at its foot. Most of the houses were old, solidly built, almost like parts of the land, and the inhabitants were slow-spoken, steady folk, fishermen and artisans and the like, settled here and at home with the darkling woods and the restless sea and the high, windy sky. I walked down a narrow street with a cool salt breeze ruffling my hair, and decided that I liked Portsboro. It reminded me of my own home, twenty light years away, on the wide beaches of Keelvig. I made my way to Nat Hawkins' store and asked for work like any drifter, but when we were alone in the back room I told him, I'm Conrad Haugen. Mike Riley said you'd be looking for me. He nodded calmly. I've been expecting you. You can work here a few days, sleep at my house, and we'll run the tests after dark. He was old for an earthling, well over sixty, with white hair and lined leathery face. But his blue eyes were as keen and steady, his gnarled hands as strong and sure as those of any young man. He spoke softly and steadily around the pipe which rarely left his mouth, and there was a serenity in him which I could hardly associate with anarch fanaticism. But the first night he led me into his cellar, and through a well-hidden trapdoor to a room below, and there he had a complete psychological laboratory. I gaped at the gleaming apparatus. How off earth! It came piece by piece, much of it from Epsilon Eridani itself, he smiled. There is, after all, no ban on humans owning such material. But to play safe, we spread the purchases over several years and made them in the names of many people. But you... I took a degree in psychiatry once. I can handle this. He could. He put me through the mill in the next few nights. Intelligence tests, psychometry, encephalography, narcosis, psychoprobing... Everything his machine and his skill could cover. He did not find out anything we hadn't meant to be found out. The service has ways of guarding its agents with counter-blocks. But he got a very thorough picture of Conrad Haugen. In the end, he said, still calmly, This is amazing. You have an IQ well over the borderline of genius, an astonishing variety of assorted knowledge about the Empire and about technical subjects, and an implacable hatred of Eridanian rule, based on personal pique and containing self-seeking elements, but no less firm for that. You're out for yourself, but you'll stand by your comrades and your cause. <laughs> We'd never hope for more recruits of your caliber. When do I start? I asked impatiently. Easy, easy, he smiled. There's time. We've waited fifty years. We can wait a while longer. He rifled through the dossier. Actually, the difficulty is where to assign you. 
A man who knows astrogation, the use of weapons and machines, and the Empire, who is physically strong as a bull, can lead men, and has a dozen other accomplishments, really seems wasted on any single job. I'm not sure, but I think you'll do best as a roving agent, operating between main base and the planets where we have cells, and helping with the work of the base when you're there. My heart fairly leaped into my throat. This was more than I had dared hope for. I think, said Nat Hawkins, you'd better just drop out of sight now. Go to Hood Island and stay there till the spaceship comes next time. You can spend the interval profitably resting and getting a little fattened up. You look half-starved. And Barbara can tell you about the Legion. His leathery face smiled itself into a mesh of fine wrinkles. I think you deserve that, Conrad. And so does Barbara. Mentally I shrugged. My stay in New Chicago had pretty well convinced me that all earthling females were sluts. And what of it? The following night Hawkins and I rode out to Hood Island. It lay about a mile offshore, a wooded, rocky piece of land, on which a moon-whitened surf boomed and rattled. The place had belonged to the Hood family since the first settlements there, but Barbara was the last of them. Hawkins's voice came softly to me above the crash of surf, the surge of waves, and windy roar of trees as we neared the dock. She has more reason than most to hate the Eridanians. The Hoods used to be great people around here. They were just about ruined when the Redskins first came a-conquering. Space bombardment wiped out their holdings, but they made a new start. Then her grandfather and his brothers were killed in the revolt. Ten years ago her father was caught while trying to hijack a jet-load of guns, and her mother didn't live long after that. Then her brother was drafted into a road crew and reported killed in an accident. Since then she hasn't lived for much except the Legion. "'I don't blame her,' I said. My voice was a little tight, for indeed I didn't. But somebody has to suffer. Civilization has a heavy price. I couldn't help adding, but the Empire's lately been paying pensions to cases like that. I know. She draws hers, too, and uses it for the Legion. That, of course, was the reason for the pensions. The boat bumped against the dock. Hawkins threw the painter up to the man who suddenly emerged from the shadow. I saw the cold silver moonlight gleam off the rifle in his hand. You know me, Eb, said Hawkins. This here's Con Hogan. I slipped you the word about him. Glad to know you, Con. Eb's horny palm clasped mine. I liked his looks, as I did those of most of the higher-up legionnaires. They were altogether different from the low-caste barbarians who were all the rebels I'd seen before. They had a great load of ignorance to drag with them. We went up a garden path to a rambling stone house. Inside it was long and low and filled with the memories of more gracious days, art and fine furniture, books lining the walls, a fire crackling ruddily in the living room. Barbara Hood, Conrad Haugen. Almost I gaped at her. I had expected some gaunt, dowdy fanatic, a little mad perhaps, but she was, well, she was tall and supple and clad in a long, dark blue evening gown that shimmered against her white skin. She was not conventionally pretty. Her face was too strong for all its fine lines. But she had huge blue eyes, and a wide, soft mouth, and a stubborn chin. The light glowed gold on the hair that tumbled to her shoulders. I blurted something out, and she smiled with a curious little twist that somehow caught in me and said merely, "'Hello, Conrad.' "'Glad to be here,' I mumbled. "'The spaceship should arrive in a month or so,' she went on. "'I'll teach you as much as I can in that time, and you'd better get your own special knowledge onto a record wire, just in case. I understand you've been in the Vagan system, for instance.' which nobody else in the Legion knows very much about. Her tone was cool and businesslike, but with an underlying warmth. 
It was like the sea wind which blew over the islands, and as reviving. I recovered myself and helped mix some drinks. The rest of the evening passed very pleasantly. Later a servant showed me to my room, a big one overlooking the water. I lay for a while listening to the waves, thinking drowsily how rebellion, when its motives were honest, drew in the best natives of any world, and presently I fell asleep. The month passed all too quickly and agreeably. I learned things which intelligence had spent the last three years trying to find out, and dared not attempt to transmit the information. That was maddening, though I knew there was time. But otherwise, I puttered about the place. There were only three servants, old family retainers, who had also joined the Anarchs. They had little modern machinery, and of course Earthlings weren't allowed robots, so there was need for an extra man or two. I cut wood and repaired the roof and painted the boathouse, spaded the garden and cleaned out brush and set up a new picket fence. It was good to use my hands and muscles again. And then Barbara was around to help with most of what I did. In jeans and jersey, the sun ablaze on her hair, laughing at my clumsy jokes, or frowning over some tough bit of work, she was another being than the cool, lovely woman who talked books and music and history with me in the evenings, or the crisp, bitter anarch who spat facts and figures at me like an angry machine. And yet they were all her. I remembered Edis, who was dead, and the old pain stirred again, but Barbara was alive. She was more alive to me than most of Valgolia. I make no apologies for my feelings. I had been away from anything resembling home for some two years now, but I was careful to remain merely friendly with Barbara. She didn't know a great deal about the rebel movement. No one agent on earth did. But her knowledge was still considerable. There was a fortified base somewhere out in space, built up over a period of four years, with the help of certain unnamed elements or planets outside the Empire. I suspected several rival states of that. Weapons of all kinds were manufactured there in quantities sufficient to arm the million or so rebels of the regular force, the twenty million or so in the solar system and elsewhere, who held secret drills and conducted terrorist activities, and the many millions more who were expected to rise spontaneously when the rebel fleet struck. There was close coordination and a central command at main base for the undergrounds of all dissatisfied planets, a new, formidable feature which had not been present in the earlier uprisings. There were rumors of a new and terrible weapon being developed. In any case, the plan was to assault Epsilon Eridani itself simultaneously with the uprisings in the colonies, so that the Imperial fleet would be recalled to defend the Mother World. The Anarchs hoped to blast Valgolia to ruin in a few swift blows, and expected that the Empire's jealous neighbors would sweep in to complete the wreckage. This gentle girl spoke of the smashing of worlds, the blasting of helpless humans, and the destruction of a culture as if it were a matter of insect extermination. "'Have you ever thought,' I asked casually once, "'that the Geranians and the Slies and our other hypothetical allies "'may not respect the integrity of Saul any more than the Eridanians do?' "'We can handle them,' she answered confidently. "'Oh, it won't be easy, that time of transition, but we'll be free.' "'And what then?' I went on. "'I don't want to be defeatist, Barbara.' You know as well as I do that the Eridanians didn't conquer all mankind at a single swoop. When they invented the interstellar engine and arrived here, man was tearing the solar system apart in a war between supernations that was rapidly reducing him to barbarism. The Redskins traded for a while, sold arms, and some of their adventurers took sides in the conflict. The government stepped in to protect Eridanian citizens and investments, the side which the Eridanians helped won the war, then found its allies were running things and tried to revolt against the Protectorate, and without really meaning to, the strangers were conquering and ruling Earth. 
but the different factions of man still hate each other's guts. There are still capitalists and communists, blacks, whites, and browns, Hindus and Moslems, Germans and Frenchmen, city people and country people, a million petty divisions. There'll be civil war as soon as the Eridanians are gone. Some, perhaps, she agreed, but I think it can be handled. If we have to have civil wars, well, let's get them over with and live as free men. Personally, I could see nothing in the sort of military dictatorship that would inevitably arise, which was preferable to an alien, firm but just rule that ensured stability and a reasonable degree of individual liberty. But I didn't say that aloud. Another time we talked of the deindustrialization of Earth. Barbara was, of course, venomous about it. We were rich once, she said. All Earth was. We have one of the richest planets in the galaxy. But because their own world is poor, the Redskins have to take the natural resources of their conquests. Earth is a granary and a lumber yard for Valgolia, and the iron of Mars and the petrolite of Venus go back to their industry. What few factories they allow us, they take their fat percentage of the product. Certainly they've made us economically dependent, I said, and their standard of living is undoubtedly higher than ours, but ours has, on the whole, gone up since the conquest. We eat better, we're healthier, we aren't burdened with the cost of past and present and future wars. Our natural resources aren't being squandered. The forests and watersheds and farmlands we ruined are coming back under Eridanian supervision. She gave me an odd look. I thought you didn't like the Empire. I don't, I growled. I don't want to be held back just because I'm white-skinned. But I've known enough Reddies personally so that I try to be fair. It's all right with me, she said. I can see your point intellectually, though I can't really feel it. But not many of the people will out at main base. Free men, I muttered sardonically. We went fishing and swam in the tumbling surf and stretched lazily on the beach with the sun pouring over us. Or we might go tramping off into the woods on a picnic to run laughing back when a sudden rain rushed out of the sky, and afterward sit with beer and cheese sandwiches listening to a wire of Beethoven or Mozart or Tchaikovsky. The old earthlings could write music if they did nothing else, and to the rain shouting on the roof. We might have a little highly illegal target practice, or a game of chess, or long conversations which wandered off every which way. I began to have a sneaking hope that the spaceship would be delayed. We went out one day in Barbara's little catboat. The waves danced around us, chuckling against the hull, glittering with sunlight, and the sail was like a snow mountain against the sky. For a while we chatted dreamily, ate our lunch, threw the scraps to the hovering gulls. Then Barbara fell silent. "'What's the matter?' I asked. "'Oh, nothing. A touch of Velchmir, maybe,' she smiled at me. "'You know, Con, you don't really belong in the Legion.' "'How so?' I raised my eyebrows. "'You, well, you're so darned honest, so really decent under that carefully rough surface, so reasonable. You'll never make a good fanatic.' "'Honest?' I looked away from her. The bright day seemed suddenly to darken. End of Part 3 Part 4 Spaceships from main base had little trouble coming to Earth with their cargoes of guns, propaganda, instructors, and whatever else the rebels on the planet needed. They would take up an orbit just beyond the atmosphere and send boats to the surface after dark. There was little danger of their being detected if they took the usual precautions. A world is simply too big to blockade completely. Hours dropped on noiseless gravitic beams into the nighted island woods. We had been watching for it the last few days, and now Ebb came running to tell us it was here. The pilot followed after him. Harry Kane, Conrad Haugen, Barbara introduced us. I shook hands, sizing him up. 
He was tall for an earthling, almost as big as I, dark-haired, with good-looking young features. He wore some approximation of a uniform, dark blue tunic and breeches, peaked cap, captain's insignia, which gave him a rather dashing look. It shouldn't have made any difference to me, of course, but I didn't like the way he smiled at Barbara. She explained my presence, and he nodded eagerly. "'Glad to have you, Haugen. We need good men and badly.' Then to her, "'Get Hawkins. You and he are recalled to main base.' "'What? But—' A dark exultation lit his face. "'The time for action is near, very near. We're pulling all our best agents off the planets. They can work more effectively with the fleet now.' I tried to look as savagely gleeful as they, but inwardly I groaned. How in all the hells was I going to contact Vorka? If I were stranded out in space when the fleet got under way, no, they must have an ultra beam. I'd manage somehow to call on that, even if they caught me at it. We sent Ebb in a boat to get Hawkins, while Barbara and I packed a few necessities. Kane paced back and forth, spilling out the news from main base, word of mighty forces gathering, rumors of help promised from outside. It was like the thunder which mutters just before a gale. Presently Hawkins arrived. The old man's calm was undisturbed. He puffed his pipe and said quietly, I called up my housekeeper, told her my sister in California was suddenly taken sick, and I was leaving at once for the transcontinental jetport. Just to account for disappearing, you know. There aren't any Eridanians or Terries hereabouts, but we desperate characters, he grinned briefly, can't be too careful. Brought my equipment along, of course. I suppose they want me to do psychometry on fleet personnel. Something on that order, I don't know. We made our way through a fine drizzle of rain to the little torpedo of the spaceboat. I looked around into the misty dark and breathed a deep lungful of the cool, wet wind and I saw that Barbara was doing the same. She smiled up at me through the night and the thin, sad rain. "'Earth is a beautiful world, Con,' she whispered. "'I wonder if we'll ever see it again.' I squeezed her hand silently, and we crowded into the boat. Kane made a smooth takeoff. In minutes we were beyond the atmosphere. Earth was a great glowing shield of cloudy blue behind us, and the stars were bitter bright against darkness. We sent a coded call signal, and got a directional beam from the ship. Before long we were approaching it. I studied the lean black cruiser. She seemed to be of about the same design as the old Solarian interplanetary ships, modified somewhat to accommodate the star drive. Apparently she was one of those built at main base. Her bow guns were dark shadows against the clotted, cold silver of the Milky Way. I thought of the death and ruin which could flame from them. I thought of the hell she and her kind bore. Atomic bombs, radio dust bombs, chemical bombs, disease bombs, gravity snatchers, needle beams, disintegrative shells, darkness and doom, and the new barbarism and felt a stiffening within me. Fostering this murderousness was a frightful risk. The main defense against it was intelligence, and that depended on agents like myself. Perhaps only myself. The crew was rather small, no battles being anticipated, but they were well-disciplined, uniformed, and trained, a new Solarian army built up from the fragments of the old. The captain was a stiff gray German who had been a leader in the earlier revolt and since fled to space, but most of the officers, such as Kane, were young and violent in their eagerness. We orbited around the planet for another day or so till all the boats had returned. There was tension in the ship. If the Imperial Navy should happen to spot us, we were done. Off duty, we would sit around talking, smoking, playing games with little concentration. Kane spent most of his free hours with Barbara. They had much to talk about. 
I swallowed a certain irrational jealousy and wandered around cautiously, pumping as many men as I could. We got under way at last. By this time I had learned that main base was a planet, but no more. Only the highest leadership of the Legion knew its location, and they were pledged to swallow the poison they always carried if there seemed to be any danger of capture. For several days by the clocks we ran outward, roughly toward Draco. Our velocity was not revealed, and the slow shift in the outside view didn't help much. I guessed that we had come perhaps ten parsecs, but that was only a guess. Approaching main base, stand by. When the call rang hollowly down the ship's passageways, I could feel the weariness and tautness easing. I could see homecoming in the faces around me. I stole a glance at Barbara. Her eyes were wide and her lips parted. She looked ahead as if to stare through the metal walls. She had never been here either, here, where all her dreams came home. So we landed, we slipped down out of the dark and the cold and the void, and I heard the rattle and groan of metal easing into place. When the ship's interior grav field was turned off, I felt a sudden heaviness. This world had almost a quarter again the pull of earth, but people got used to that quickly enough. It was the landscape which was hard to bear. They had told us that even though Boreas had a breathable atmosphere and a temperature not always fatally low, it was a bleak place. But to one who had never been far from the lovely lands of Earth, its impact was like a blow in the face. Barbara shuddered close to me as we came out of the airlock, and I put an arm about her waist, knowing the sudden feeling of loneliness which rose in her. Save for the spaceport and other installations, main base was underground. There was no city to relieve the grimness of the scene. We were in a narrow valley between sheer ragged cliffs that soared crazily into a murky sky. The sun was low, a smoldering disk of dull red like curdling blood. Its sullen light glimmered on the undying snow and ice, and seemed only to make the land darker. Stars glittered here and there in the dusky heavens, hard and bright and cruel, almost as in space. Dark sky, dark land, dark world, with the sheer terrible mountains climbing gauntly for the upper gloom, crags and glaciers like fangs against the dizzy cliffs, with the great shadows marching across the bloody snow toward us, with a crazed wind muttering and whining and chewing at our flesh. It was cold. The cold was like a knife. Pain stung with every breath, and eyes watered with tears that froze on suddenly numb cheeks. A great shudder ripped through us, and we ran toward the entrance to the city. The snow crunched dry and old under our boots, the cold ate up through the souls, and the wind whistled its scorn. Even when an elevator had taken us a mile down into the warmth and light of the base, we could not forget. It was a city for a million men and other beings, and more than a few women and children. A city of long streets and small, neat apartments, hydroponic farms and food synthesizers, schools, shops, and amusement places— factories, military barracks and arsenals, even an occasional little flower garden. Its people could live here almost indefinitely, working and waiting for their day of rising. There was little formality in the civilian areas. Everyone who had come this far was trusted. A man came to us new arrivals from Earth, asked about conditions there, and then said he would show us to our quarters. Later, we would be told to whom we should report for duty. "'Let's go, then, Con,' said Barbara, and slipped a cool little hand into mine. I could not refrain from casting a smug backward glance at the somewhat chap-fallen cane. End of Part 4